Hello everyone, this is uh, Professor Hosselman, History 105, and this is the second part of our French Revolution lecture. Um, this one's going from the date 1792 to 1803. Now, the leaders of the French Revolution, their attempt to demolish the Ancien Regime without eradicating the monarchy, the church, or other long-standing institutions in France, but resistance to the revolution by the king, most aristocrats and clergy, and the invading great powers of Europe would ironically throw the revolution into the arms of the radicals. Now, the situation in 1792 was dire. Having failed in his attempted counter-revolution, the king became a virtual prisoner of the Constitution of 1791. France was beset by enemies on all sides. The old royal army was riven by faction and unreliable. The state was still laboring under its long-term debt. And many clergy rallied against the revolution encouraging their flocks to join counter-revolutionary mobs. Now, on August 10th, 1792, the revolution took a radical turn. <clears throat> a mob, excuse me, <clears throat> of ordinary citizens stormed the Tuileries, demanded a republic, and killed 600 Swiss guards. The Paris Commune, an elected body appointed by Georges-Jacques Danton, Minister of Justice, but a special court he established um, to try the enemies uh, of the revolution was not enough for the radical Paris workers, who stormed the jails for a week in early September, murdering or injuring nearly a thousand such enemies of France. The National Convention, entrusted with drafting a new Republican constitution, was divided between the Girondins, or the moderates, who still wanted to work with the king, and Jacobin, who were urged on by the Saint-Culotte and led by Maximilien Robespierre. They wanted to push the revolution in a more radical direction. And then a third group at the convention was called the Plain, or La Plaine because it existed between these two peaks of extremism. So we have the Girondins on one side and the Jacobins on the other. The state of national emergency uh, uh, produced some radical solutions. On the 21st of September, 1792, the National Convention declared France a republic and began to draw up a new constitution. The convention established a committee of public safety soon dominated by Robespierre and the Jacobins, and it gave it responsibility for running France. Now, to deal with France's dire situation, it created the Levée en masse, or a vast national army, conscripted from all adult males. The Committee of Public Safety reformed the army, installing promotion on merit, but purging any officer of aristocratic background, even if he supported the revolution. The levée en masse, uh, opposed by smaller professional armies, pushed the enemy back beyond France's borders by the fall of 1793. In the summer of 1794, the levée en masse drove the Austrians out of the Austrian Netherlands, uh, that is Belgium. In what had been a defensive war of liberation to save France and preserve the revolution, now became a war of conquest to spread the revolution beyond France's borders. So at home, <clears throat> the Jacobins uh, sought to create a perfectly egalitarian and secular society, even if that meant infringing on uh, li personal liberties. They established free compulsory public education for all boys and girls. They established the right to public welfare for the poor. They imposed price controls on bread, but they also abolished the right of workers to form associations and unions or go on strike. They abolished such titles such as Monsieur and Madame in favor of Citizen or Citoyen. They established a, a new calendar dating from the revolution. They intended to replace the superstitions of organized Christianity with a cult of reason and they confiscated church and noble lands, redistributing them to the poor. They even replaced old royal measurements with the metric system. Now, with the revolution beset on all sides, the Committee of Public Safety decided to eliminate its enemies via show trials and execution. The king was tried on a charge of tyranny and conspiring against the Constitution in December of 1792, 
and executed in January 1793, with the vote for immediate execution winning by one vote. In September of 1793, the convention approved the Reign of Terror. Its victims included first royal noblemen, then anyone of noble birth, clergy and other conspirators against the revolution, numerous bourgeois and peasants who had simply expressed unpopular opinions, and finally anyone opposed to the Jacobins and Robespierre. Overall, 250,000 were arrested, 17,000 were tried and executed, 12,000 were guillotined without trial, and untold thousands died in jail, including the king's son, Louis XVII. Now, the reign of terror ended in the Thermidorian reaction, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Thermidorian reaction in July of 1794, when a group of Jacobins in the convention, fearful that they were next, brought charges against Robespierre himself, who was soon executed. The National Convention later broke the sans culotte. And as in the English Civil War, the French Revolution now turned back towards moderation, even conservatism. Now, the next constitution took three years to draw up and resulted in something called the Directory or the Directoire in 1795. Its structure implied a step back from democracy. Its, execu its executive consisted of a five-man board of directors selected by the legislature. The legis legislature consisted of two houses, the Council of the Agents, or the Conseil des, des Anciens, and the Council of 500, or the Conseil des Cinq Cents. The members of the legislature were elected by property owners, the 30,000 wealthiest male citizens in France. Now, the directory was consistently unpopular. It was criticized by politicians on both sides of the political spectrum. The directors were known to be corrupt. The directory pursued an aggressive military policy to distract the populace from the corruption and the depressed economy. In 1794, the anti-French, anti-revolutionary alliance collapsed. Prussia, the Netherlands, Spain, and Savoy signed peace treaties, and this left only Britain and Austria in the field. In 1795, France annexed the Austrian Netherlands, and in 1796-97, French armies pushed into Italy. But by 1799, most of the country was sick and tired of revolution, war, high taxes, high prices, new constitutions, and directors. And many Frenchmen began to long nostalgically for the good old days of rule by a strong king. Now, the rise of Napoleon was the result. Napoleon, born in 1769 of minor Corsican nobility, had early on tied his star to the revolution, rising as the officer corps was purged of aristocrats. In general, at age, uh, a general at age 24, he won a series of victories for the revolution. He took the royalist French city of Toulon in 1793, and he suppressed riots against the Directory in 1795. Thereafter, he swept through Italy, establishing a pro-French puppet republic in the north and gaining territory along the Rhine from the Austrians. France was now an empire again, and Britain was alone. All of this brought Napoleon to the attention of the lead director, Paul-François, Vicomte de Barras. Now, Barras wanted to exploit Napoleon's popularity to enhance his own. But the young general proved a little too successful, especially following his spectacular invasion of Egypt in 1798. Now, upon his return from Egypt on the 9th through the 10th of November 1799, Napoleon led troops against the Directory and forced it to dissolve itself. France was to be ruled by three consuls, with Napoleon at their head. Though millions of people boycotted the plebiscite in which this was approved, and the government faked the results. Now, Napoleon concluded that France was badly in need of a restoration of strong central government before it could face its external enemies. 
Now, before Napoleon could turn to domestic reforms, he had to take the heat off from, from France's enemies. In 1799, a new French alliance was formed consisting of Britain, Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. After completing a series of successful military campaigns, climaxing in the defeat of the Austrians at Marengo, Napoleon forced all parties to discuss peace. The Treaty of Amin was signed in 1801. Everyone knew that this was a truce, but the two years breathing space it gave allowed Napoleon to begin his domestic reforms. Now, Napoleon's domestic reforms lo um, look, on the surface, to be liberal, egalitarian, and revolutionary. But they owed more to Louis XIV than to Voltaire, Rousseau, and Robespierre. Napoleon instigated the drawing up of a new series of law codes, uh, resulting in the Napoleonic Code, or the Code Napoleon, between 1804 and 1811. Napoleon guaranteed free public education for all, but that education included indoctrination in strict patriotism and loyalty to Napoleon. Now, Napoleon also established a national bank, reformed French government finances on the English model, and stabilized the currency and imposed taxes equally on all. In 1801, Napoleon and the Pope signed a concordat, or concordant, recognizing the Roman Catholic Church as the official religion of France, but also preserving religious toleration. Confiscations of church land were to cease, but previously confiscated land was to remain in current hands. Napoleon was also to appoint all the bishops. The administration of France was kept strictly in Napoleon's hands. The legislature became a rubber stamp. The press was censored. The local administrators of the 83 departments kept Napoleon informed of everything going on in their districts. And a secret police monitored opposition and disposed of dissenters and dissidents. Now, these reforms institutionalized the revolution while enhancing Napoleon's power. Napoleon began as a soldier of the revolution, a man of relatively common birth who rose to the top through merit. But once in power, Napoleon made himself the absolute ruler of revolutionary France. <clears throat> he dominated the administration of government. He dominated the wealth of France. He dominated the religion of France. And of course, he was the undisputed commander of the army. Now, there remained only one of Louis's rules of absolutism left unfulfilled. In 1802, Napoleon had himself proclaimed First Consul of France for life. In 1804, he assumed the title of Emperor. An emperor, of course, needs an empire. 